evening and welcome to the Village of Bartlett Committee of the Whole Meeting, September 17, 2013. Clerk, please follow the roll. Trustee Ahrens? Here. Camera? Here. Carbonero? Here. Martin? Here. Rinke? Here. Shipman? Here. President Wallace? Here. First item on our agenda this evening is under planning and zoning. Um, Trustee Kammerer. Thank you, Mr. President. We have several things under planning and zoning this evening. We're going to start off with the uh, Walgreens rezoning, resubdivision, site plan review, special use, and variations. And at this point, I would ask uh, Jim to take over. Thank you, Trustee Kammerer. Uh, this is the uh, Walgreens project with the petitioners Bartlett Venture One. This is, you've seen this before, before it went out to its public hearings, is now coming back to you. Uh, it's located at the northeast corner of Route 59 and Stearns Road. And just to refresh your memory, uh, it's a resubdivision of the existing Brewster Creek Center, and it's a plat of consolidation of the lot, what is portion of lot two and the old Clark gas station that used to be at the northeast corner and creating a new lot one in that subdivision. They're rezoning the portion of the uh, shop or the gas station right here that was zoned B2 and it's, it's going to be, re they're asking to rezone it B3 neighborhood shopping which is the same zoning as the shop, rest of the shopping center. There's a site plan review for lots one and two, including the new uh, Walgreens, and then the remainder of the site, which will uh, basically stay the same. They're asking for a special use permit for the Walgreens for packaged liquor. Uh, currently, Walgreens does have one, and they're asking for seven variations um, in the, in the uh, site, a 34-foot reduction from the required 50-foot corner side yard along Route 59, a 1.4-foot reduction of the required 30-foot rear yard, which is on the north end of the Walgreens site, the canopy encroachment within the required corner and in interior side yards of more than three feet, generally the canopies for the building and the drive through a reduction in the required 20-foot interior parkway landscaping width requirement at Stearns and 59, Parking encroaching in the 50-foot front and corner yards along Stearns and 59. A reduction in the 180-foot parking stall measurement to 162-foot, which is typically a standard measurement these days. And a reduction in the number of required parking spaces for lot one of nine parking spaces. Uh, the petitioner has uh, is the proposal in addition to all that is to build the new Walgreens on lot one, a 14,820 square foot building that would have a 24 hour operation with a drive through pharmacy. Um, Walgreens uh, typically goes to that in its new standalone uh, uh, projects. The entrances generally will remain the same along Stearns Road, the in and out at Stearns Road, and then the widened Route 59 entrance per IDOT's review of this at the right in, right out along 59, and then circulating into the site. One of the unique features of this site is that the entrance into the parking lot for Walgreens is for the, obviously, the car traffic and the exit at this, um, there is a, a no left turn into this and then right out only at this point in the, uh, which would be the southwest uh, corner of, or southeast corner of the property. Truck traffic for the deliveries will enter in primarily off of 59 and enter and deliver in the back of the store. The big, those are for the smaller trucks. The big trucks will come in at off peak times and just enter in the shopping center and then deliver at Walgreens and not during primary times. And then there's a drive through on the uh, east side of the property, uh, the proposed uh, site. Um, they've gone through the Plan Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals. The uh, traffic analysis has been done. We have our traffic engineer as well as our uh, environmental consultant because there is a portion of the site that has some environmental issues at the uh, corner 
and those have to be remediated according to their no further remediation letter, um, which they have received. Um, the uh, plan commission recommended approval with all the staff conditions and findings of fact, and the zoning board of appeals recommended approval with their findings of fact and the minutes. The uh, picture of the building, which I forgot to show you, is up now. But the minutes of both public hearings are, are included in the package, as well as information that we have provided as far as the traffic analysis, the landscape plan, the different uh, landscaped areas, the traffic flow. I'm just showing a picture of the site. You can see it's the vacant parking lot of the and the vacant site of Clark's. There was a last-minute list of conditions that we received from one of the neighbors, Mr. Lewis, who spoke to you earlier, and I've handed that out to uh, the petitioner as well as all the board members. So those, that is information that we just received today. And there are the petitioners here, and it's, he's got all his experts, and I'm sure he's ready to answer any of your questions. This, this lot one site plan does not include what, at this time, what IDOT has recommended, and I believe this one <coughs> is the more radius <coughs> curve, but they have to meet. IDOT reviewed it. They would not let them do this taper. And so this, what they did at, want them to open up the radius on that entranceway. So that's all IDOT would allow. So the, the the plans you have here, as they progress through, the final plan will have to meet all the conditions. That's why some of the conditions are written and not in the maps, because they don't, they'll do those final maps and, and final plans based on all of our conditions and the ordinance that we'll approve. This is really more of the, for the landscaping, though, this particular one. Is that the that's the existing entrance into the mall now, correct? This, this is, right here is the existing entrance. They're I know, not, but from from 59, I mean, it doesn't have that triangle. It, no, they. This is the entrance off of. I don't know if I have a picture of it. Let me see. Uh, I don't. Yeah, let me go back to the overall plan that shows. This site plan shows okay. pretty close to what it looks like. I got it. This one's maybe this is a little small to see that, but that's what it looks like now. What's going to happen is this radius is going to be opened up so there will be a little wider entrance into there. And that's all I that would allow. There was a proposed taper that was to come off of 59, and I that would not allow that. And the exit to Stearns Road is on the left side of this drawing? Yes, yeah, Stearns Road entrance and exit is basically going to remain the same. The only thing that's going to change, and I don't, this is, that's why I pulled this one up, it's a little bigger. This exit out of the Walgreens proposed parking lot is going to be right out. You can't turn, you can't come in the Stearns and turn left in here. You have to go all the way back here to the second entrance and then in. And you can only come out this way. But this Stearns Road configuration is going to stay the same, for as you see. Long? For how long? I'm sorry. I, that Stearns Road configuration is going to stay that way for how long? Well, for this project, it is. Now, if, if the county decides to make some changes to Stearns Road, I, 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 don't, I can't predict what they're going to do in the future.
Again, my name is Richard Lewis. Uh, I live at 868 Braintree uh, in Bartlett, uh, right behind the current Walgreens location, and we have some other neighbors here that live along Braintree. Uh, we expressed uh, an, uh, a number of concerns uh, about this, and uh, you know, one of them is the capacity for that intersection. And as we understand it, uh, IDOT is currently looking at perhaps doing some uh, reconstruction of that area. Uh, and we are certainly concerned that uh, if some of this were approved, uh, do you begin to handcuff what IDOT can do in terms of widening sterns, uh, perhaps the right turn lane or those types of things. So, you know, that's one concern. Uh, the other is I think we may be perhaps a little more inclined to look on this proposal in a favorable light, uh, but we haven't had particularly good uh, relationship in history uh, with the current strip mall there. And, uh, you know, I think we've had a couple of discussions uh, you know, just previous to this about, th uh, about that. But, you know, I think the residents feel that that area is not very well maintained. I know that the mall thinks that it is very well maintained. And so we kind of go back and forth on those types of things and get concerned uh, about what's going to happen uh, once this is approved, if it were approved, what happens to the existing location. It's a very large area, certainly a concern for us of what may go in there uh, that could uh, adversely impact uh, the neighborhood. The other part of it is is the traffic. The traffic um, going along uh, and cutting through Norwood, Norwood and Braintree has been a long outstanding issue uh, for us in this neighborhood. And we've been before this board on a, a number of occasions uh, as different things have come up such as when the mall was first being built, there was concern about traffic. But I was like, eh, it's not going to be a whole lot, so you know, you can kind of live with it. It's for the good of the village. Then we get a daycare center that came in. Again, we're in front of the board saying, well, we're not sure about the traffic. That, again, it's for the good of the village. McDonald's came in. There was an argument about that. So it kind of continues that, okay, we keep shoving stuff into this space. How much is it going to actually hold? Is the capacity really there? to shove something like this in there. And, and obviously, I think it would be hard for anyone to argue that, boy, let's do something with that lot. It is an ugly, ugly site. But are we squeezing something in there that just simply doesn't, simply doesn't fit? Um, the, uh, the email that I did send today was some things that a couple of neighbors, and I certainly don't want to say that that represents the entire neighborhood in terms of some things that we would like to see to be beautify the area do some screening between the residential area and the uh, and the shopping center. So uh, please don't take that as something that uh, uh, a whole bunch of people necessarily put together. Um, but again, I've talked a little bit uh, just tonight with some of the owners, and I think we want to sit down and talk about uh, the, what is a true and strategic way to evaluate this proposal and what's the best interest for the village. Is this truly the best interest for the village? Uh, you know, the, the location really, as you begin to think about, does that fit, why not look at other locations in this village? There are numerous other locations in this village. Uh, certainly the uh, strip mall across the street has a large capacity, especially when you begin to look at the Nest Cafe area. There's an area north of, I believe it's Apple Tree Lane, or south, I guess, Apple Tree Lane in, in uh, Route 59 wide open, I think it's 10 acres or more that's open there. Now again, I think from Walgreens' perspective, I know that the corner store is ideal. Maybe that doesn't fit in. But if we look at then 59 and West Bartlett Road, there are certainly two large corner lots there that would have the capacity for a large building, ample parking, uh, and certainly would have the advantage of, uh, again, a large traffic area close to two retirement villages with huge prescription volume, and certainly would give uh, some, uh, you know, a nice entryway into the downtown area, which I know is a concern for all of us. Uh, how do we get traffic to come in off of 59 and into the village? So there's certainly alternatives uh, to this location. Uh, but, I, I, you know, again, I think we want to look at a specific plan of what's acceptable beautification and maintenance for the shopping center, including the rear of the building. You know, I think, uh, and I've been asked this question, is, which is, you know, you moved in behind a strip mall, what did you expect? Well, I've got to tell you, unless you lived in our shoes, you have no idea what you have to expect when you live behind a strip mall like that. And I think it's beyond uh, what's reasonable currently. And I think the more important question is really to the shopping center owners, which is, 
you built a shopping center right behind a residential neighborhood. What did you expect? Do you expect that we're just going to allow this to just keep uh, expanding and expanding and the traffic is okay to come rushing down your street day after day uh, and those types of things? So I think it's important to, to look at the whole thing. So, uh, you know, I think before this would ever be approved, I would like to sit down uh, and maybe the village with the owners and start to say, okay, what is an acceptable plan for this corner in the long term and this strip mall before we approve it? Once it's approved, we really have no leverage left in terms of what could go into the old Walgreens. Uh, could it be a, a, a bar, live bands, you know, those type of things? I'm not opposed to bars and live bands necessarily unless it's right behind my house and then I am. So there's some things that I think we could certainly look at there that would be the, for the good of the village uh, and for the uh, the entire neighborhood. So I appreciate you listening. Anyone else have any comments? Good evening. I'm Tom Reimars. I live at 1537 Greenleaf Court. I've lived in Bartlett for 31 years. For more than half of those years, I've driven by the corner of Stearns and 59 and looked at that eyesore, that vacant lot. Um, I'm all for the uh, Walgreens moving into that spot. Um, it'll improve the site. I'm for utilizing the drive up because right now I drive to Hanover Park. It's easier to get in and out of there with a prescription filled. I'm for the additional tax revenue that will come to Bartlett rather than what's going to Walgreens that have drive ups. I'm for uh, also, um, all, I'm for, uh, uh, although I'll probably never see it happen. The additional taxes coming into Bartlett that might help reduce or maintain my taxes, my property taxes. Uh, I'd rather see my dollars spent here in Bartlett. Thanks. My name is Steve Rouse. I live at 838 Braintree. Um, I'd like to ask permission to use the petitioners, uh, their PowerPoint there, of the overall site plan. Uh, was there another one? Maybe. Maybe the overall site plan will do. But, yeah, I read part of the traffic report where they were measuring the signal cues. Um, for people going to Stearns up to 59 and one signal queue the the traffic was uh, could all get through the light I think a large reason for that is a lot of that traffic is not waiting for the light they're running down Braintree and up Norwood because it's much much faster to get to 59 and they're just bypassing the light it goes on all the time um, so I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. If this is approved, maybe a no right-hand turn in there during certain hours, something to start to reduce that traffic there. Thank you very much. Hi. My name is Lori Abbott. I'm at 847 Braintree. I didn't prepare anything. I just wanted to come and listen about the Walgreens plan, but now I'd like to say something. I have to echo off my neighbors, Richard and Steve. They're absolutely right um, about the traffic. In fact, I called the Bartlett Police Department this morning because I was taking the garbage out after I walked my daughter to the bus, and everybody is flying down Braintree, as you know, and um, I had to turn the trash can so the arrows point out, and there was four cars that were trying to avoid the light and nobody was heading southbound but these cars going northbound they didn't even swerve they were probably within 36 inches of me so it bothered me I called and I said enough's enough I understand that they're doing something that's going to help 
but they also should monitor this traffic, especially when the children are going to the bus to and from. And as far as Walgreens, um, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I think down by um, West Bartlett Road is fantastic. Um, down by that retirement center is an excellent location. Um, there is too much going into that mall. I don't think they care about what goes into that mall. I know they don't care what the mall looks like. And if you've driven by, it's outdated. The traffic plan is not good. My daughter currently takes Taekwondo there, and frankly, I can't wait till she's finished because it's dangerous, and I will not let her go by herself. It's, it's, it's dangerous. So I hope you consider this carefully. I have a suggestion. I don't have a horse in this race, but listening to what they were saying about Braintree, um, I know when I worked in Schomburg, there's certain areas of Schomburg, Hoffman Estates, where during business traffic, you'll have like no right turn or no left turn, so that you can't cut through residential areas. Maybe that's a fix for these where these people live behind the strip mall, is make it so that people that are doing a business there can't turn onto their streets. Just an idea. Is there anything stopping us for no through traffic signs? Or I, maybe they're not enforceable, but maybe that might dissuade some people traveling down their streets, especially at these times. To get because I actually have done the same thing. I've, except I usually go Kingston, the back way, especially when they were doing the digging over by Beaver Pond. But is I know we have them across the railroad tracks where you can't turn in certain hours. Yeah, I mean. That would help these folks out. Chief, uh, Chief, have we considered something like that for traffic control? Or I can tell you, uh, to this point, no, I, we haven't brought anything before the board. Uh, we do respond to the congestion. It is congested. There are cut through traffics down there, and we we. Uh, do, do our best under the ordinances that have already been passed. So, yeah, if the board wanted to consider uh, additional signage, we could put a study together to give you some options on that. I think that's an easy direction. Yeah, I think at the, very least, at the very least we need some car counts on Brain Tree. Yeah. Um, I don't want to shoot from the hip and go putting up more signs until we have some, at least some data to work off of. And, you know, are we are we finding out that well, yeah, it's 100 cars a day, which is maybe normal for that side street, or are we, are, you know, are we at 700 cars a day, which is really abnormal. And I'm not in any way um, discounting what the residents have told us. Um, I live on a dead end street. Sometimes it seems it's too busy. So I know what you're saying. Um, and it seems like traffic is. We all know the traffic at 59 and Stearns is a major concern, and we know that. Or we believe that IDOT's going to do some work there soon, hopefully, sooner rather than later. Um, so this, this, is, this is a really difficult portion of this project for me personally, is the, the traffic implications. Um, I could probably go on for a half hour about it, and I won't. But um, those are, those, I, I echo the residents' concerns, and I think everybody who lives in Bartlett's concerns just about the traffic in that area. Um, that's what I'm struggling with. I would ask, um, have we actually considered whether this does or does not handcuff uh, us in the future for IDOT's potential um, work at 59 and Stearns? Has that been addressed? Well, here's the difficult issue with that. We, we have very little, in, we have little to no information about what it is they're going to propose, when they're going to propose it, how much right away they would want, or uh, we just don't have any information to do that calculation. But, I mean, can, can we draw on traffic counts that are going north, uh, east and west on sterns that are existing now and anticipate what may happen? One of the things that the petitioner is doing is he's dedicating some additional land for future right-of-way on Stearns Road for any, any proposed expansion that could occur there. Uh, that's one of the reasons that he asked for the variances because of that, that right-of-way. But at this time, we don't have any, any dimensions. But he did dedicate a portion of it, and, and they have, they, I don't know if you can see it, but they're doing this 
what they call a corner cut. So this portion of property right here is going to be dedicated as future right of way okay. to the highway entity. And I um, think at the last meeting, I believe it was our traffic engineer yes. who yes, essentially assured me that he didn't think there would ever be their standards a need for a right turn lane on westbound Route 59 on the northbound, or excuse me, westbound Stearns on the northbound 59. Our consult, traffic consultant, Mr. Coulter, is here if you have any questions or you want him to restate Perhaps some of that. Perhaps he could address that just yeah. briefly, Brent, wherever Mr. And he's hiding way in the back here. there. I think any count we do right now anyway on Stearns is not going to be accurate because of all the construction there too. Yeah. Let's let the engineer yeah. discuss that. Um, hello. Yeah, what, what I gave you, at the, I think what you're referring to at one of our, your committee, the whole meeting actually, was was my opinion that, that based on the right turn volume, westbound on Stearns to northbound on Route 59, that a right turn lane was not warranted based on the volume of right turning traffic. And a right turn lane on Stearns Road westbound to northbound was also not part of the preliminary scope. Uh, that IDOT was proposing for the intersection. What we what we know about the preliminary scope at this time uh, is that it would involve southbound dual left turn lanes on Route 59, northbound dual dual left turn lanes on Route 59, eastbound dual left turn lanes on Route 59, and a northbound a south excuse me a southbound right turn lane on Route 59. That's the scope of work that they used in the application for the federal funding that they, that they have already earmarked for that construction job. Um, but there will be a phase one study, which they're in the process of doing right now. Uh, there will be public involvement, uh, and of course the, the village will be involved in that process as a stakeholder you know, in the area uh, to comment on, on the proposed plan. So. As Valerie indicated, all, all we can do at this point is give you our best idea of what might happen. I should point out that that IDOT has reviewed the site plan with respect to specifically and, and probably a focus on uh, the right in right out on Route 59. There's also a signature block on the plat of resubdivision, uh, which is signed because because this resubdivision occurs at or along a state uh, frontage, uh, an arterial frontage on, uh, with the IDOT jurisdiction, uh, the district engineer uh, will, will have to sign off on that plat. So they've had not only their permit engineers, but the district engineer himself will have to sign off on the plat uh, uh, before the plat of subdivision is, is finally approved. So that's some assurance that you have that, that IDOT is going to be taking a look at this to make sure that it does fit into the scope of their uh, potential intersection expansion. I probably feel a lot more comfortable if that IDOT engineer lived on Braintree. But, um, or Norwood. Or Norwood. What impact would a traffic count on Norwood or Braintree have on your, your professional opinion that we won't need a right turn off of westbound Stearns on the northbound 59? In other words, do you take that into your I realize that you didn't study this specifically for that intersection as far as making that right turn on the northbound 59. But if you were to make a study about that, would you take into consideration the amount of traffic that's avoiding that turn completely by going through the residential neighborhood down Bra Braintree and on the Norway? Uh, or is that not really even come into play? No, it's relevant information. And I've never seen a study to that effect, and I think your idea is a good one that before we just go off and, and shooting with ideas about what, what we do with Stearns and what we do with Braintree at Stearns and Norwood uh, uh, in terms of maybe traffic cutting through from Nor onto Norwood and then back down onto, onto Braintree, uh, that, that there probably should be a study that addresses to what extent that kind of cut through traffic is already occurring. What we have right now, what I've seen, are the right turns that exist on Stearns at 59. If there's, if if the number of right turns from Stearns captured by Braintree to Norwood and then right turning onto Route 59 
is very, very high, yeah, that could be significant. Uh, but I've never seen that information. Okay. That's all I have for him. Don't go Thank too you. far. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? I'd like to hear from the petitioner if you'd like to rebut anything. Or Hi, I'm Tom Helgeth. I'm the uh, petitioner. With regard to the local traffic in the area going cutting off of uh, each major road here, what I found to be very helpful would be put down local traffic only. And then if you begin ticketing people who go down there, it'll, it'll be well known that if you do cut through there, there will be a, a, you'll get a ticket. If you do put local traffic only, that will definitely help. Up in my neighborhood, they have it that way, and believe me, people have learned and they don't, they don't uh, cut through the, in the area where they don't live. Okay, and that, that would help. Thank you. I'm uh, Jim Hall, 824 Redwood Lane, so I don't have a, really a dog in this fight, but uh, one question uh, regarding from something Mr. Lewis mentioned, who is the owner of this new property the same as the existing building? Who's, who's going to own the, the new property? The petitioner is Bartlett Venture One, LLC. Now, are they the owners of the existing property? I, I no. do not okay. know that. Okay, so you're dealing with so you're dealing with two different entities then regarding the landscaping around the existing property and the the new building. Okay, anyway, let's go on. Uh, secondly, regarding one thing regarding traffic, I used to drive there every day uh, to and from work, and one of the biggest problems there is that the light, the green light, for Stearns Road is way shorter than it needs to be. Just a few seconds longer would greatly improve the traffic flow at that intersection, especially during rush hours when things really back up. Would hardly, it would, I would think it would have, I'm a retired manufacturing engineer, uh, would, I would think it would have very little impact on traffic on 59, but would greatly improve the, the uh, flow on, on Stearns Road. And so uh, the third thing regarding traffic on Braintree, I uh, used to work with a factory in Matamoros, Mexico. They would put uh, speed bumps on major arterial streets in the middle of the day. And so just uh, kind of facetiously some, something to consider on Braintree. Thank you. Hi, Art Pershonic, 925 Auburn Lane. As many of you know, I live in that subdivision along with my neighbors there and been listening to everybody's comments here and a lot of good comments back and forth, traffic, safety, taxes for the village. No one's mentioned the traffic at the other side of this uh, mall also by the Dunkin' Donuts and the McDonald's. Eventually, if they do cut off the left turn from that strip mall onto Stearns, everybody's going to funnel out to Norwood and there are traffic jams at Norwood and the McDonald's and the Dunkin Donuts in the morning. I mean, the other day I couldn't move because there was what they call a Mexican standoff. Everybody was making a left turn, right turn, and nobody could get through there. I think the best comment that anybody made was this mall wasn't meant to be expanded at this point. I hate to see the tax revenues go away from this particular place, but it's not built for an expansion like this. So let's weigh this very carefully, and uh, it's a tough decision, but there are other opportunities in Bartlett also to keep Walgreens in town. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Sia. I'm from 858 Bartlett, um, Braintree Lane. Um, I got a piece of data. It's less than scientific, but I know most of the traffic going through Braintree Lane is from the mall because 
every two to three days, I'm having to pick up McDonald's bags off of my parkway. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? If not, then any of the comments by the board? If not, then uh, I would suggest that we move this on to the uh, for a, a vote at the uh, next meeting. Then. Are, we, are we able to get those car, car counts done before the next meeting? The what? Something that's possible. A car count right now, only because it is at unprecedented levels right now. We can do it for you, and we will. It, it, I just, uh, with the construction there, I have to vouch for the neighborhood. It is at all-time highs right now. Because the next step would be final vote, correct? Yes. Just for additional information, I don't remember how many years ago, but there was a traffic study that uh, measured the cut through uh, traffic and things about the time the sidewalks went into the area and might be some helpful information. I know at the time the traffic was increasing significantly then. I'm sure it has even more, so it wouldn't be absolutely current, but at least it would be some data for you to look at. And Mr. Lewis, have you noticed since construction and a significant increase? I mean, you see it day in, day out, right? Uh, I mean, is, is it escalated tremendously since the construction started this year, or has it always been that way? Well, it's, it's escalated, certainly, with the new construction, but it's always it's been very heavy, and it continues to get heavy. And like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's kind of as the new, as that area expands and, and more things go in there. Uh, and certainly, although I can't speak to it, but as the McDonald's went in and those types of things, it's continued. Um, and of course, there's other o open lots over by the uh, oil masters that's waiting to be developed as well. So you know, again, more traffic that uh, that cuts through there. So, uh, and I should mention, I invited the certainly the mall owners. I, I invite all of you come visit. Well, you know, come over and uh, the neighbors will be happy to show you around uh, uh, the street, show you what's going on at, at any time. It, you're all more than welcome. TL knows, but. Well, I don't want to belabor this any more than we have, but it is a very big decision, and for me personally, it's kind of a difficult one. Um, but, to, I mean, to that end, I guess I, I would love to see when this does come up for final vote that there's been some wonderful collaboration between the mall owners and the residents. And they come up with all these really cool, inexpensive solutions to all their concerns, and the residents are 100 percent behind it. That being said, that's probably a fantasy, um, but those are some of my thoughts. Most of the petitioners got anything else they have to say. Okay. So at this time we're going to be sending this back to. Yeah, we're. we you know, we're. I'd like to add a comment only okay. if the uh, board would take a look at this. Um, we have the egress on Stearns Road from Walgreens. It still has a left turn lane. I would like to see a port shop there. So this way there's a right in and a right out only. For safety on, reasons. On the stearns? Yes. No left turn in, no left turn out. Uh, speaking for the petitioner, um, that left turn lane on the stearns has uh, existed for 23 years. Uh, actually, one of the highlights of this proposal, I believe, is the fact that the corner is going to be used as a parking lot and will uh, give greater uh, visibility for whatever occurs on Stearns World if it uh, does do uh, the improvements. Uh, if uh, if the, the site was built just onto the corner, there are three approved full access uh, entrances into that uh, site from the river main from the old Clark station. Uh, this proposal not only eliminates those three full access sites um, locations, but uh, also uh, in, in, uh, drive somewhere to focus towards the 59 entrance. So we're, we're not asking for any new entrances or exits. We're improving on the one entrance on 59, which is the one I think everybody would want to see it improved. And we're, by, by backing the Walgreens off, uh, leaving that area with greater visibility. So I think just from a traffic standpoint, and both all of the consultants, I think, would say this is uh, um, 
they they all agreed that uh, the amount of traffic that would be increased uh, by Walgreens having drive through is uh, would be de minimis and so that's still not going to keep the people show the full picture south or northbound on 59 and turning, they're still not going to keep the people who are going north on 59 and turning right onto Stearns and then scooting over parking putting your turn signal on those people are going to get rear-ended from the left turn lane off of you mean you're talking from a left turn lane into uh, Stearns into uh, right. into the center something uh, to consider it's a safety issue I haven't driven through that intersection in three years um, sir, could you please, I'm proud of that. sir, could you please state your name and address just for the record for me? Uh, my name is Dennis Cortese. Um, my two sons are, my true family trust, are owners of uh, part of the, uh, both uh, Barla Venture One and Brewster Creek. And your address? It's 707 Fairview Lane, Bartlett. Thank you. Just for that reason. My name is Wayne Rogers. I'm with Barla Ventures One. Uh, I've been involved in this project since it began, the uh, original shopping center. Uh, this was part of, I believe it was Campanelli's develop. Was it Campanelli's? Yeah. And this was always a, going to be a commercial corner. Uh, when we developed this, the daycare, it was Children's World on Stearns Road, had a problem with access. Uh, we were asked to provide an exit for them coming into our lot and you can see it on the picture above these are mostly people that are from the east they so have to turn can't turn and go out uh, eastbound on Stearns Road they're gonna come through uh, Braintree and the other subdivisions they have to uh, I agree with the neighbors people cut through there they also cut through the shopping center when the lights uh, turns they hop to the shopping center, go out the right in, right out, or the main drive. So that is a problem, and I think something should be uh, done with the uh, cut-through traffic. Thank you. Vince, I half agree with you. <clears throat> if, if you. If you're going west on Stearns, uh, if you're actually up there and you're going to go east on Stearns, it might take you two minutes to wait but you're not going to go through their neighborhood. So that's if, if you block that, peop, people are going to go through their neighborhood to get on Stearns one block further south or two blocks. But um, if you're going west on Stearns, I'm, I'm sorry, start again. If you're going east on Stearns and you're on um, this lot trying to cut across, yeah, we should put a no left turn there. So I, that, that won't affect their neighborhood at all. And they just either stay on 59 and turn here. Are you talking about a no left turn just beyond the intersection? Right where that bank is, the animal shelter on the other side, the, yeah. The animal hospital? Yeah, so if you're you're coming towards where, you know, you're, you're going, you've already crossed 59 and right where the bank is, you can't turn left because, yeah. Correct. Yeah. We, correct. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do that. But if, if, we, if we limit the people who are already in the parking lot to go left, um, they're going to go through. They're going to go through their neighborhood, adding more traffic. So I think we should keep the left on the one, but they can't cross traffic to get into the Walgreens there. If if they wanted, then they should have turned north, or they should have continued north, and they go into that right there. And that, that I think helps. that's the idea. That somebody mentioned that the last time too. That it yeah. will force people to go north on 59 because that is problematic. I drive by there every day when people are dropping kids off at the, at their child care, and that 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 is problematic right there. People are trying to go left into, especially with the construction, they're trying to go left in to get their kids, and it backs it up past 59. Yeah. If I may. Can you please state your name yes. and your address, please? My name is Javier Milan. I'm a senior consultant with KLOA Incorporated, and we conducted the traffic study for the Walgreens. I just wanted to bring out three issues that I, that I see, and it's regarding the proposed development. In our opinion, it's going to be an improvement over existing conditions for mainly three reasons. Somebody mentioned uh, there's some existing curb cuts right now on 59 in close proximity to the intersection. There's, I believe, another one on Stearns. Those will be eliminated. Uh, that's, that's a positive. Anytime you reduce or remove something that is too close to an intersection, that's a positive, and it's going to be using existing cuts farther away from the intersection. 
Of all the possible land uses uh, that could be developed, Walgreens is probably the most benign given that it is currently there. So it's not new traffic. They're just moving from their site to being a, an outlet or a, a, or a freestanding one. So, so it's not something new. It's not a Burger King that it's not there. It's not a Starbucks. Uh, it's not a gas station that wasn't there. It's already there. All they're looking to do is just move independently or, or freely. So, and last, the existing writing right out, it's currently not up to code. It's, it's actually a very tight writing right out. Uh, as part of the plans, it's actually going to be relocated slightly north, and it's going to be actually designed and constructed to either standards with bigger radiuses and bigger lanes. That's actually going to make it easier and more attractive for people to actually use the lane, and as you alluded, the whole idea is to try to capture as much as you can from 59. In this case, by doing that, anybody coming from the western sterns, with whatever improvements the state might do, most likely will find it easier to actually make a left and go right in the right in instead of making a left, as it was alluded, that left into, into sterns. People coming from the south, I would venture to say 100% with the new design, we'll make it, we'll find a lot easier to make a right instead of making a right and a left to go uh, inside the shopping center. So those three are, are, are some of the ideas that I had as to why this will be an improvement over existing conditions, and I just wanted to share that. Yeah, but again, yes, the Walgreens may or may not go in, but we also have to remember if they do move, something else is going to fill those locations, and we don't know what that will do to the traffic. We don't know what kind of stores they're going to let in there into the old Walgreens, what's going to go where Blockbuster has been. Some of those areas are vacant, and that's another thing to consider. There's no further comments, and I think we've already suggested that we move this on to the next meeting for a final vote. Thank you. We'll do that. Okay. Next thing on the agenda was the video gaming for new business, and I think I would ask our village attorney to uh, comment on that, if you would, Mr. Morass. The la <coughs> Pardon me. At the last meeting, there was extensive discussion regarding video gaming and some of the legal restrictions mm -hmm. relative to uh, controlling it. And we talked about the fact that the idea of coming up with an ordinance that would uh, prohibit an undue economic concentration uh, would be contrary to what the board's original basis was because that would have to be applied to existing existing bars and restaurants that have liquor licenses as well as new uses. And also it would be difficult, I use the term the devil's in the detail, relative <laughs> to what would be too much. So we didn't talk about those things. I did mention that um, that there is a loophole that I see in the current ordinance uh, that as these towns have been dealing with the issues uh, you see and that is the current format in our ordinance as well as in the state video gaming act is if you have a liquor license then it's pretty much automatic that you would get a video gaming license and so a potential uh, applicant for a liquor license who's intent on getting video gaming could not disclose that intention to the village, get their liquor license, and then add it, and you would then lose your opportunity to 
control it. And we talk about, well, what is that opportunity? And our ordinance deals with controlling it through our Bartlett Liquor Control Ordinance. And we talked about having basically three uh, of varying degrees of discretion that this board would look at. And in most cases, uh, unless they already have a special use for liquor at a given location, they would need to get a special use of zoning decision relative to get a liquor license in a business district. They would need this board to create a license for the classification that they're seeking. And finally, the mayor, acting as the local liquor commissioner, uh, would decide whether or not to grant the license. And I pointed out that there has to be good cause not to grant it with respect to the liquor commissioner, and that was your greatest level of control. Now, since then, there was a letter that was received, I think, placed in your packet by a potential applicant who uh, was before you. I think it was the Maxine uh, petitioner who has another uh, facility in another town and pointed out that that they have seen in certain towns, and this can be throughout the country, so it may not be limited to just Illinois, is the potential for maybe limiting video gaming based on a square footage. So, for instance, <clears throat> if uh, this board feels that if it's too small uh, or not enough seats, that perhaps, uh, at least going forward on a go-forward go basis, that perhaps there's is there the potential to say that you can't have a license unless a video gaming license unless there's at least for example 1500 square feet um, again or at least so many seats uh, that i think that was alluded to in the letter from uh, i believe is in your packet uh, there's also we've seen in some towns uh, that you only get one machine per so many square feet. So no more than one machine, for example, you know, per 400 square feet. And that's a possibility, at least relative to the very small type um, potential video gaming operations where that's really all they're doing, uh, where it's not video gaming ancillary to food service and alcohol, but rather primarily just a video gaming and then food and, and alcohol is ancillary to that. Um, those, whether you do that or not, it does go back a little bit to the discussion about whether or not the village has concurrent jurisdiction with the state. But I do believe that those, if that were the board's inclination, that those would be closer to the mark and more easily defensible than trying to come up with comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive dual type of ordinance that mirrors what the state does, where we have our own regulations and then talk about undue concentration, where then it's just a horse race in a given area between your existing licensees and the new ones who come in. and you get too many in, you know, one area, you, you know, and, and the areas are different. You know, there, there are certain areas, say 59, which in theory there could be more as opposed to maybe other areas. And so the, the, I was trying to dissuade, or I wasn't, uh, it's not in favor or, uh, <coughs> The, the notion of the undue, concent undue economic concentration, because that was something that was talked about a while ago. And so what you have before you is simply the closing of the loophole. And I draft the memo and, well, drafted the ordinance to close that loophole. That's what's before you this evening. The notion of some other ideas that, again, rely on an argument that could be challenged, but it's on a you know, on the assumption that we have concurrent jurisdiction with the state, 
to also look at further regulations um, relative to setting a minimum square foot for a facility that could have a video gaming license. Again, you're not just relying on alcohol. It's riskier from a defending that type of a regulation because it relies on an argument that we have concurrent jurisdiction. It's not the exclusive purview of the state. But it's not as onerous and um, there's there's a stronger argument if that's something the board wants to consider. We could look at further amendments besides this. You could either have close the loophole first and we come back with that or we could bring it together with adding square footage type. I'd have to look at where we fit it in the ordinance and, and uh, the, the village code if it's just liquor or uh, more in our separate section where we're regulating just video game because right now as I told you if they have the prerequisite ordinance I mean licenses from the state, a state liquor license, a state video gaming terminal operator's license, and a part liquor license, it's automatic. And there's no basis for the village administrator not to issue a video gaming license. Hence the reason for the closing of the loophole. But there's, we can look at, at a future time, uh, you know, given some direction if the board is concerned with too small a location. Because we've seen towns where they want to have a boutique license given that town, and they want to have them just in small spaces. They don't want it in, in bigger locations. So it kind of depends what your goals and preferences are and direction, and we can try and, you know, further limit it beyond what we have here. But this is what I what you have before you is what we talked about last time. Some of these other ideas have come from third parties or staff looking at, you know, other towns. As I say, the act is so new, towns are <laughs> reacting, and um, I don't think anyone knew that that there would be an influx of out of town type uh, national companies that would be the first ones in and. Uh, uh, you know, that's what we'd see first. And everyone would be grandfathered in that, say, it's too small to hold five? No, I, that's the problem. So if you're going to go there, uh, it's a license. Again, you can't favor in town compared to out of town. So whatever that size is, that's going to apply to everyone. Can't so they, would, they might have to go back and lose a machine or two if they were a certain lower square footage is what you're just saying. Well, a typical space. Uh, Why can't we grandfather? I don't understand that. Because you can't favor your existing licensees to out-of-town licensees. Okay. Some, and then on the other side of the coin, there's some vested rights that uh, people have who have already applied. So, for instance, what's before you this evening that are the two other items uh, can't retroactively apply the size limitation there. You may have the ability to deny it based on the other issues we already talked about in terms of liquor license control, special use control. Um, so. so any other questions by the board? Yes. Um, so I kind of understand where we're going with all of this. One of your suggestions is that the the board would make a determination as to the minimum square footage required for, well, as a condition of a video gaming license. Yes, and that has some inherent risk in it, but yes. And that's when we get into the concurrent jurisdiction yes. issue. Yes. To, with to the, do that, you have to make the first argument that you have the authority via concurrent jurisdiction to do it, but yes. God bless home rule. Yes. But that only takes you so far. Yes. At what point... And, and I think you kind of touched on this. At what point does a, a video gaming establishment become video, a video gaming establishment as a principal use under the zoning ordinance? 
because it seems like, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about this in terms of the license, but on the other hand, the real, the real concern from the public health, safety, and welfare uh, perspective and something that we would probably be in a little better position to defend on would be, you know, video gaming as a, as a principal or accessory use. Um, the current, you know, well, when I looked at the issue before, the way the act works, it's so tied to uh, the issuance of a liquor license, they don't come out and say that you, your zoning ordinance can't control. I've seen towns that uh, would argue that it's an accessory use, um, and then you get into, uh, they have to look at what our percentage, sometimes it ties into, uh, I don't recall if we have a like a percentage of floor area uh, as to what your accessory use can be compared to the principal use. Um, so that's something to look at. But again, um, it's still a special use for the liquor, whether or not they need another special use. Currently, we don't have video gaming as a special use, and I question whether we may have the authority to do that, to just make it there's some open question to that, but I do think looking at it from the angle of principal use versus accessory use uh, may have some merit. May I love all this. Something we could the, look the, at. the legal talk kills me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> essentially what we're saying here <laughs> is, is that you're saying that you can potentially, and just so everybody in the room yeah, understands, well, what we're trying to do is making sure that everybody that wants to get into this in a business in Bartlett knows the playing field. That's really the only fair thing to do as a village, right? Yes. And we also want to make sure that, that as the board, we're doing our responsibility to represent um, everybody in Bartlett's best interest. So if I understand you right, Trustee Ranke, you're saying that you're potentially looking at zoning ordinance for usage purposes as uh, one of the determining factors, and that would probably need some more research. Yes. Um, and then, and what we're suggesting on this new ordinance is, is primarily um, uh, square footage. Right now, we didn't, don't address the issue yeah, of square yeah, footage. Really. This, this particular ordinance that's before you is to close the loophole. That's yeah. what we talked about last time. Just, I did not get into square footage. I, you know, staff would have to look at, give me some, give us some more input as to what square footages of typical spaces are and things of that nature. It's, so just so, I, so that I, I, issue of square footage came up from a third party yeah. after we talked about this. This particular ordinance um, suggests that if somebody's going to apply for a license in the future, they have to indicate right. the usage. Okay. Right. Up front. Up front. Up front. And then, you know, so we know. And could. So they don't sort of backdoor get the license and then. Trustee Rank, you put, put in your. What is the word you use? Most common use? What they're going to use the facility for primarily? Right. Uh, the predominant use. Of, uh, I guess what I would argue is that at some point, an establishment, we'll call it a bar, is, isn't a bar anymore. It's a separate use. It's a video gaming establishment. And right. the liquor license is kind of academic. And that's something probably Jim could talk more about you know, zoning speak in terms of what's a use and everything. But I think from our perspective, we can make a legislative judgment that certain establishments are different. With some of our liquor licenses, you have to have a percentage of food service right. to be able to qualify for a particular uh, liquor license. And so that may be what you're getting at, Trustee Ranke, is that so these don't become simply bars and video games uh, that we do have some percentage of food delivery. Um, the one this evening that had that, I uh, don't recall, I think it was the F, Tokyo Steakhouse. That's a restaurant type liquor license where they have to give right. the floor plan on a certain percentage. It's our only classification. And there are some towns who don't want to, don't have classifications where they have alcohol without food service. We do, unfortunately and if that's where we want to go. So we have several, and we have them out there, and people have them. And they may have a vested right to, to what they've already got. Uh, there was a you know, push at one point. If you're going to be a restaurant, get that, that F if, if that's the class where there's 
uh, a limit. On, you know, there's a floor plan. There's a limit. There's even, as I recall, revenue uh, limits uh, where alcohol is, I, I hate to use the term and confuse it, but sort of ancillary to the principal use of a restaurant and food service as opposed to a bar, which would be a different classification. So, Can we put um, another another line in there too if they <clears throat> you buy the bar two months later you turn around and sell it and now I apply for the license it has to be like a two year waiting period or something like um, that our license are not transferable so if you start change over. ownership you start over you your license goes away and you have to start from scratch it's not I can't sell the bar and sell the license the license goes away when the ownership changes and they have to reapply so that particular loop, okay but any one of these changed. that used to have gambling we'd take the gambling back right away then that's a good question well yeah. on, their, on mean, their new license they would have to state whether or not right they were going to under this ordinance anyway, right they'd have, right they'd have to state whether or not they well, were planning it, on, I, I i personally think it's one thing if the gambling's already there and new ownership versus Oh, I'm going to set up a bar, and two months later, I'm going to buy it from TL, and now I'm going to apply. But right. she's not the original owner, so hey, why, why are you going to refuse me? But I, I don't I think it's just the liquor license. It seems to me it's just like the state license, whether, whether you buy an existing business, if you buy an existing um, uh, gaming uh, establishment, you still have to go through all the well, you have to go steps through, for the state. Right, but what I'm saying is, you know, if 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 they you apply you, you buy the bar mm -hmm. and no I have no intention of setting up uh, a gambling two months later you don't want you, you were just a shell now Vince buys the bar hey I want hell why can't I put gambling in there because he has he doesn't have that license he didn't he, buy the license well, never no, no, the license. no but then we have to we have to find grounds to say no and if if we if we put something in there you can't even apply for two years until you've run this then that kind of, you know, but, no one's going to, th th it's going to be less likely they're going to have someone like T.L. buy the bar and then Vince going to buy it from her. I mean, it's, you know, it kind of takes out a shady just, element, I think, it personally. It would be like a brand new business going in anyway. Not necessarily. You buy, a, you buy, if someone bought Brock's, they they got a name already. Why would they change the name? I mean, yeah. you buy companies because they have that name. Well, it would go away. They'd have to comply with this and give a site plan and... Uh, apply to the state if they buy a bar like that to get the video gaming license. It wouldn't be automatic, and they'd have to apply for a new liquor license from us. But there is an element of, you know, people want to sell their bars, and, and you do, you know, not want it vacant. So you're going to feel that you need to grant the license in some respects. But at that point, they'd say whether they have, they want video gaming under this loophole closer ordinance, if you want to call it that. Um, and, again, if they already had video gaming, um, you know, that would be something that you'd have to consider. That's right. So, go ahead, I'm sorry. Was the consensus that we're going to move forward with this as is? That's my question, Brian. I, yeah. The question you're asking us tonight is, do you want to pass this or, or move this ordinance forward as is, or are we going to go around I this more? I would suggest we do, because... Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to just move forward with this ordinance now. I think we should. We have many more discussions yet to have. Have other discussions in this loophole. You know, every, you know, it, there can be people in the loophole, uh, in the pipeline apply. Now they may have certain rights it, to that. So I would get this passed. We can explore and look at what we've got out there if the board wants to bring it back at some point to look at. Uh, Square footage limitations, table limitations, if that's something the board wants to see. That's just, that came up after the fact, but we put it in here because it, it came in and, you know, I wasn't, we would, staff would need to do more uh, work at looking at what's out there. I guess, I guess then to that. my take on this for your committee is just exactly what he said. I'd like to see this move forward onto yeah. a final vote and let's continue to ask Brian and the staff to really. I mean, clearly this is an important topic, at least to me, I think the rest of the board, and let's keep our eyes and ears open for other opportunities and options that we might have and bring them back to us as, as they come up. That would be Unfortunately, most of the things that I think that we're talking about 
are, are going to be unprecedented for years. You're not going to know if you're going to get sued if you restrict a license based on square footage. You're not going to know if you're going to get sued based right. on whatever until, right. it, until it actually comes down the pipe. And, so. and, it's and true. the phrase from Facebook, we don't even know what it is yet. Right. right. So yeah. we still, I, I know we're working on collating numbers once they're available, but that's true. We don't, I, we don't really even know what this means to the village as far as revenue and stuff, right? Good. Correct. Right. Yeah. So why don't we move forward here? Consensus yep. would be that Go we ahead move forward to the next meeting and yep. this up for a vote. We'll be happy to do that. Thank you very much. Make this one go away. Moving right along. Do we beat that horse now? Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Elsie's Place Special Use for, for Beer and Wine. And I'll move this back to Jim for any uh, information you'd like to relate. This is... Uh, the petition from Chuck Knobloch on behalf of LCI Highland of Illinois, and they are requesting for a video gaming and the special use permit to serve beer and wine to open a video gaming slash restaurant facility at our town center. Um, it was uh, discussed at your September 3rd meeting, um, and we also had some video gaming discussion at that meeting, and you continued it to this meeting. But the petitioner is essentially asking for a space within the town center to get a special use. Um, this spot was originally a deli um, <clears throat> back in, uh, uh, it was, and it's next to Click Photography. The petitioner's space is a 11-seat uh, restaurant area with five gaming potential gaming establishments, so what they call the entertaining area entertainment area they are asking for the class B liquor license and once they if they get a class B license they would be able eligible to apply for the state video gaming license again their proposed hours of operation are coinciding with our liquor license uh, which would be 8 to 1 and Friday and Saturday 8 to 2 um, they originally talked about they would not probably be open that long uh, the parking center, the parking for town center has 161 spaces. There would be 10 spaces necessary for this space. There's ample parking there. But the petitioner also has a, uh, without, I won't go through all these because they have a proposed PowerPoint that they'd like to show you. And the, uh, Mr. Lindman, who is one of the uh, ex executives of the company, would like to explain his proposal. And so I'm going to have to get out of this screen and then uh, pull up their proposal. Let me just minimize this. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I know it's been a long evening, and I'm happy to run through this if you'd like to see it. It's a little background on our company and, and, and our history and what our plans are for um, Elsie's Place in Bartlett. Um, Lieberman Companies is a 106-year-old uh, business. Um, my brother and I were on the bottom there in, in the only color picture. Uh, our fourth generation in the business, and we currently run our existing operations. Um, our base of business is in Bloomington, Minnesota, um, but we've done business in the Illinois community and the Chicagoland area for many years. Uh, what is our relevant experience, and why, do we, why did we come to this idea? Um, we have, over the course of our history, been in the restaurant business. We owned a, a, a chain of snack bars and shopping mall food courts um, under the a and flag. Um, at one time, we had 270 units in 40 states, um, which we sold to A&W in 1998. Um, we had locations in Aurora, West Dundee, um, and uh, in Woodfield Mall, for example, in Illinois. On the gaming side, primarily our experience has been a distributor of gaming equipment. Um, we've been licensed in a number of states for Class Three gaming as a distributor. Um, as we go through the process here, we understand uh, that we can't operate the gaming, but we at least have knowledge of it. Um, our current business structure, uh, we have a distribution business um, where we sell uh, video games, vending machines, and, and uh, sell and process ATMs. We have a game route uh, where we operate games in uh, bars and restaurants, um, a finance business, and an um, investment business. 
really our appeal and why how we got to this project and to Illinois is, you know, gaming and restaurants are part of our company history. Uh, when Illinois opened up for gaming, we saw an opportunity here. Obviously, you've seen based on um, the applications from other companies like ours, we're not the first of the party, but uh, we believe our food experience will give us an opportunity to do some things that will make us a little bit different. And we're a uh, fourth generation entrepreneurial company uh, that look forward to working with Bartlett and other communities as we move forward. Um, our menu, um, you know, a picture of our menu uh, that we have here. Um, we have some renderings. This is actually some renderings of the Bartlett space. Obviously, um, you know, we have a little bit of uh, work to do related to uh, what we're um, going to do moving forward, but this is pretty close to what we'll be doing. And, and one of the features that we have in our locations is we'll have uh, historical pictures of Bartlett or the communities that we're in um, as part of our design package. Um, it's just another picture showing you how we would envision the gaming setup. Um, our signage, uh, floor plan that you, uh, was up before, uh, just to give you a little idea of what we're envisioning there. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're not strangers to the Illinois market because we're based in Minnesota. Uh, we've had experience. Uh, we owned a distribution business of, for records and um, CDs and video cassettes um, in Elk Grove. Our restaurants uh, were based in Illinois. Um, we had a parts business in Bensonville for a period of time. And through our uh, distribution business, we have a number of vendors um, that we currently um, buy product for for our distribution business in the Chicagoland area. So um, the Chicago market is, is very uh, familiar to us. Um, the process, as you mentioned, with the liquor license and the gaming license, um, it's all a part of what you have to go through. And we feel um, that we have an opportunity um, in the market and in Bartlett, and uh, we hope we can move our um, a project on to the next level. Um, I appreciate your time. So, Is there any questions from the board? Yes, I have a few. Um, you say you've been in, uh, in business for 106 years, that you have a facility in Bensonville. Is that facility a uh, 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 gaming? No, we had, a, we had a business in Bensonville one time. Um, I was just showing you the um, some of the business um, interests that we've had in the in the area, but that was not a gaming establishment. No, it was a, it was, a, it, was a it was an unrelated business um, to the gaming project. It was a, a replacement parts business, selling okay. um, a variety of products for the amusement and vending industries. How many employees will you have on premises at any one time? Um, depending depending on. Um, you know, the uh, volume of traffic, uh, one to two. One to two? Yep. Are these, um, are these foods uh, distributed um, by machine? No. Well, we're going to um, have, uh, well, we're going to have um, convection oven, microwave, roller grill. We're not going to have a hood or a um, uh, full kitchen, per se, but we are going to have products that we're familiar to making with, in some of our past businesses. And uh, Chuck Knobloch, who talked to you last week, who's our operations manager, also has some other products that um, he's dealt with in his vast experience in the restaurant business that we'll be putting forward also. And what is your, who is your target uh, consumer? Target consumer is, um, I would say, uh, men and women between the ages of uh, 45 and 65. Uh, may skew a little older, but that's our primary target. Okay. Um, you, your hours of operation that you requested are until 1 a.m. on weekdays and 2 a.m. 2 a. on um, weekends, which matches our particular um, uh, liquor ordinance. Are you, are you fully aware that this, uh, this space lies directly beneath residential uh, residential zoning apartments yes yeah and how will this affect them 
I don't believe um, that will have a major impact on the um, residents in the area. But you don't have any any evidence to support that. Is that correct? I, I don't have any evidence to support that based on um, you know the location and the area that we're looking at is new to us um, and our experience related to this as many people um, in this uh, market are finding is a new project um, but I believe that when we started to look at areas where we thought we would be a good fit um, that did not discourage us from moving forward with a lease. Have you, have you met any of your potential neighbors in the town center? Uh, I have not. I, um, you have, Chuck? Yeah, I, I, I talked to the gentleman at Two Toots and the gentleman at the liquor store and I think there's a, a spa or something next door. I, I walked through the, the entire uh, area, and I also sent out those cards to the that was required. But back to your last question, you know, and I think one of the other trustees asked that last time. You know, when you look at the demographics of who we're dealing with, you know, we're not going to have loud music and and you know ne all these neon signs in the window and things like that. It's a, it, when you look at who you're looking to target. You know, you're looking to have a casual, safe environment where people can come and, and relax and have a sandwich and, and do some gaming for a little while. So, and when I did those hours with Jim, it was you know the idea was to stay within the city ordinance of what the hours allowed. If the business doesn't dictate being open till one o'clock, you know we've already found in some other communities opening at eight in the morning doesn't work. We will we will address that back. But when we filed the 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 business, you know, license, it was to stay within what the city would allow. What's your projected uh, sales tax income or sales tax below, <laughs> so to speak? What kind of sales tax revenue are you are you going to generate to the state? That's a good one. That's thought. like shooting <laughs> blind. Um, the uh, you know we have some projections that we've done, um, and uh, you know and I don't have that in front of me at this time, um, but. Um, the state of, uh, of the gaming revenue, um, this, the state, the location, the operators split that 100% of the revenue. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, off the top of my head, it's a good question. I um, mean, I can provide you with some projections if you'd like them, but I don't, I don't have that in hand at this, at and this meeting. How, how did you pick Elsie's? Uh, it's, it's my grandmother's name. Is it? It was, yeah. yeah. Well, that's terrific. Mr. Lieber, I have one. I have to, it was, I have it was to very scientific. So, in, in case you couldn't tell from my tone, I think we have enough gaming establishments, but we can't legislate against your coming into town. I think that you're, um, I, I, and forgive me, don't take this personally. I think all gaming uh, uh, focuses on a certain age group, which you have already described and uh, it's like um, uh, go it would be like going to the convenience store as opposed to going to uh, the department store so what you're offering is a quickie and the boat is offering a more widely varied uh, gaming experience so I, I think that um, uh, well I had to say it I don't I, I, I wish you weren't here. <laughs> I'd, I wish we didn't have all these gaming applications because I don't think they do the, the town any good whatsoever. Now, in light of that, and to back that up, I'm going to ask you immediately, if you do come into town, are you going to join the chamber and are you going to be a, a very supportive member of the chamber? We'll Would that be within your purview? I, I will say that um, Mr. Knobloch lives in Streamwood um, and uh, is in, in Bartlett and has been in Village Hall many times, and we would support the communities that we're in. It is in our nature to do so. Okay. But, but you're just going to have uh, – your, where is your, where's your corporation? We're based in Bloomington, Minnesota. Well, that's a long way away, isn't it? That's what my wife thinks as well. So, uh, um, what we find a lot of times is that uh, we get uh, the, the non um, non-resident business owners 
and we and the village actually doesn't get any support from them at all so i i want to also warn you ahead of time i got your number so um <laughs> if you do come into town you'll be called to participate whether it's uh just money or it's physically okay Mr. thank you understood I'm done. mr lieberman yes um obviously you were here earlier and you heard our discussion um on your square footage Will you still be there if we only allow three machines? I mean, that's if we went with a suggested 400 square feet. It, you know, it's, um, it's something we would have to discuss internally because our modeling is for five machines. Um, and, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know that we would... Uh, walk away from a great opportunity, which we feel Bartlett is, but we would have to consider that in our internal um, uh, discussions. The questions from the board? Yeah. Trustee uh, Ship. Very briefly. First of all, thank you for considering our town for your business. As with many other communities, we're certainly looking to bring in as much business as we can. That being said, you can tell by the discussions here that this evening that this is a very sensitive topic for members of the board. And so I propose, I guess, one question, perhaps a follow-up to that to you. Um, the name of your project is Elsie's Restaurant, correct? Elsie's Place. Elsie's Place. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I guess my question to you is, if you were to categorize this, would you categorize this as a restaurant concept, or is this a gaming establishment? Well, considering our... Uh, primary background in this experience is in restaurant. I would say restaurant with gaming. Uh, restaurant first. That wasn't an no, option I gave you. I, I mean, <laughs> restaurant, restaurants, is, as I showed you in my PowerPoint, is our background and our experience, our primary experience. Okay. Well, but with that noted, looking at your menu, I can't say that we'd have to say that you were a very upscale restaurant just looking at what you're offering on the menu seems like things you're going to have to be wrapped in plastic and thrown in a microwave and then served to people is that correct um i would say that uh our you know in, in anything that you do in life you try and focus on things that you know and understand and the type of foods that we have proposed are things that we know and understand from our past history if you go to, for instance to dunkin donuts and look at their their operation they have microwaves and convection ovens. They don't use any high-tech uh, uh, machinery to, to get their uh, food to, to the table. So, um, you know, to a degree, we feel like we are trying to bring um, a style of product and a type of opportunity that we know and understand. Other questions from the board before we open it to the audience? I, I would just make one comment, um, and I think it alludes to Trustee Aaron's comment regarding how many staff you have present. Uh, it's my understanding that there's got to be somebody within eye shot all the time somebody is gaming. And if you have one person in there that's turned around cooking or whatever, trying to run dishes out here or there, I could see that as being problematic to, to actually staying within that constraint of, of what the law requires. Were you familiar with the, the yes. requirement? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, with, with a nice shot. Because I noticed that you had one, one staff member proposed as well, so um, that seems to be uh, a little problematic with, especially if you have five machines running and you got food going different places. Well, I also think it's a 21 and over establishment, too, which I'd asked earlier. Okay. So that we, there should be no kids in there. Yeah. Or yeah, there working. would not be any. True. What if somebody brings the child? You're right. Ask, ask him. What well, if somebody would, uh, brings a child? Um, all, uh, Chuck has been Bassett trained. We also will have our staff Bassett trained um, in um, uh, as well. Um, it's a, uh, it's not a, it's an over 21 location. Um, they will have to have an understanding of you know what our standards are and our goals are, and and you know you have to some, sometimes you have to make. Um, as a, a manager, a worker, tough decisions, on, um, but the right decisions. And our staff will be trained and are, um, to do the right thing. 
So. So, so if you received any opposition in enforcing that, you'd have to call the police? Well, you'd, you'd have to hopefully be able to resolve it um, within the staff that you have. And if it, if it went to that level, you'd have to do um, what you had to do to get it resolved. Any other questions by the board? Thank you, then, Mr. Lee. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'd open this up to the audience. Hi, I'm DJ Mills, and I live at 241 South Main Street, in at 208, which is in the Bartlett Town lofts in the, the very front section. Um, and first, I welcome all businesses to Bartlett. I think Bartlett's a great town. But with that said, I have some major concerns um, with the, the gaming and the liquor coming in to specifically the town center. Um, number one, there are 16 resident units that we own our lofts upstairs. Okay, we own those. Um, to date, we've lost 50% of our value just due to uh, the economy. And so my concern is having a gaming um, restaurant with liquor open till 1 o'clock, I think is going to hurt the value of our, our condos. That's my personal opinion. Number two, being open till 1 o'clock in the morning, I mean, really, try to respect the people that live above you. Um, back in 2006 when the town center was filled, which was a great, you know, great year, 2006 and 2007, and then 2008 the economy changed. But when we had La Deutsche Vita, and they were open really late, um, Unit 201 and 202 could not sleep at night because the music was so loud. And then you could smell the cigarette smoke. So and that building, the way it's made, we don't have really good soundproof, okay, and it's been an issue for a long, long time. So during the summer months, we're not going to be able to have our windows open because of the noise level. Number two, we have the uh, liquor store. Um, the liquor store was robbed at 9.30 in the evening last year. So I wonder, with people um, gambling, per se, you know, and drinking, if that's going to... Uh, create rowdiness. Um, the next thing is, is that we constantly, as owners, are picking up liquor bottles, uh, lotto tickets, just from people purchasing from the liquor store. With a gaming, you know, again, that, that's going to be my concern. With 16 units, uh, uh, condo units, are you guys aware that there are nine children under the age of 12? from two years up, uh, two-year-olds, to um, kids in first grade, second grade, and they're coming home from school. I wonder about their safety and the fact that they go to bed, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, because they have to start school. With, you know, an establishment being open till 1 o'clock in the morning and the noise level, I don't think that's fair to us as residents. I think this is it, it's a great concept, but take it in a strip mall. And, I mean, we're at the police department's right here. This is great. You know, we feel safe in that, that respect. But what, what's the ratio of parking? With 16 units, and if they're married couples and all 16 units are married, that's 32 spots. We already have parking problems with um, the town center. People park in our specific um, parking space any time the fire barn has a uh, um, a party or, or something, or a lot of times because of the farmer's market, people park in our spot. So how are we going to control that? So that's another issue. Um, being bottlenecked in, in this area with the lights and stuff, especially around the dinner time hour, I, I'd be really, really concerned about that. Um, the, I just am very concerned about the noise level. Um, and the, oh, the other thing, too, is Two Tooths is very children-friendly. And then we have a great eye doctor, and she treats children, too. Um, and then we have the liquor store. I thought the, the reason we had the town center was to bring people to town. We have the, uh, the parade 
Um, we have the art fair, uh, usually around here. We have the farmer's market. I just don't think that this gaming is in the right section of town. I mean, that, that is my biggest concern. I, I understand the town center is empty. I used to be in there as well as everybody else, and it was a great center in the life of those years, but it's not. And let's bring in some businesses that can just grow, but grow with our community and be children friendly, and I don't think this is children friendly. I think if the age bracket is 21 and older to 65 and to 1 o'clock in the morning, I'm totally against this because I live there. And I know what the noise level is. I know what the garbage level is. So please just consider that when you're, you're making your decision. Thank you. Yes, sir. As always, I'm too outspoken. Most of you know that I come up here and speak for a number of things, but you may also know I'm an EDC commissioner. Um, one of the things we're charged with is to try and drum up business for the downtown. You don't know a lot about me personally, and that's because there's really no need. One of the things that I am passionate about is where gambling belongs and my view on drinking. I dated somebody that was an avid gambler, and she found a way to spend every dime I made. And back then, I was making good money. Now, most people know I'm dirt poor. Funny thing is, I'm not anti-gambling. I just believe there's a place. I also realize the state says... You have to allow it in our town. The previous administration said, okay, we're going to do it. This new administration is much more conservative. Part of my job as an EDC commissioner is to welcome everybody into this town, whether they have gambling or booze, or they want to have a child-friendly establishment, etc. I totally understand what that lady's saying, and yet I understand the businesses. I uh, ambushed Eric last meeting as he was supposed to go to a special commission because I was aggravated that we basically told two businesses that wanted to come in, you got to hold off. I mean, here's the irony. I, in looking for work, I also run a big Facebook group of 4,000 online Facebook gamblers that gamble no money. It's just playing on Facebook. So I'm not adverse to the machines. But I totally understand where, like Greg said, we don't want a little Las Vegas. I think at the time they were talking about these machines, I think I heard like the maximum payout is 200 bucks. Anybody that really wants a gamble, if they're going to go to Elgin or Aurora or Joliet or Indiana or wherever, with the, the Indian reservations, because these diehard gambling people, they want to make, they want to go and blow a lot of money on the chance they're going to hit it rich. It happens, it's not likely. Personally, I wish that we had no video gambling in Bartlett. I wish that we had a lot of restaurants that just served maybe wine and soft drinks, maybe beer, but that's just my personal taste. I think that one of the dangers I see here, and maybe it's not part of the village's problem, maybe it's a state problem, is that video gaming licenses seem coupled with liquor licenses. I wish that there was a way that they were separate so that you could provide a person who wants to open a restaurant and serve booze the chance to do so and make the, game, the video gaming be a totally separate process because we're denying businesses because they may, this last gentleman, he said right up front, he really wants to have those machines. But some of the places, well, it's a nice to have. As Eric said in some of the, some of the others last uh, meeting, they were talking about, do we have any studies? Well, it's too new. We don't have studies yet. Is this a big revenue booster? This guy from Minnesota, he could probably tell you better because he's been doing it a while. But anybody around Illinois, they really don't know. I think it's a slippery slope any way you cut it. You can't deny them being in town. You want to be business friendly, but we come across as we're business hostile. I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, you want to accommodate the residents. You want to bring business in. You don't want loud music and whatnot, but he said they're not going to. What is the answer? And I think we're, we're trying to put a lot of band-aids on something that really is, like, poorly architected. It's just my two cents. Any other comments from the audience? I actually have an uh, email that was uh, sent to me from the uh, manager of the uh, loft uh, 
condominium units who couldn't be here tonight since he's uh, just traveling. But I'll read his email. Uh, his name is Scott Sutter. He is the owner of a residential condominium unit in the Bartlett Town Center loft building at 241 South Main Street. He currently manages the Bartlett Town Center Lofts Association as well as the Bartlett uh, Town Center Condominium Number no. 3 Association at 275 East Railway, uh, Railroad Avenue. Um, he gives some detail about the history of the actual uh, complex, um, but I'll skip through that. Um, the proposed location for Elsie's Place is directly beneath loft number 213 located at 241 South Main Street. The 241 Main Street loft building sits directly above the commercial building and currently has one entrance directly next to the town, uh, to the town liquor store located on the south end of the building as well as back entrance located near the northeast corner of the building. The loft building is comprised of 16 condominiums. The residential building located at 241 South Main Street currently has 14 children under the age of 16 residing in it. The consensus among the unit owners and residents of the Bartlett Town Center <coughs> loft building at 241 South Main Street it is that permitting an establishment where the primary business activity is video gaming in such close proximity to a residential condominium building is not a good idea. He goes on to say that the words and phrases destination, location, family friendly are commonly associated with Bartlett Town Center. And I believe that such sales pitch that brought two toots, a children's family diner, into town. I do not believe that liquor stores and gaming parlors were part of the original vision for a mixed residential commercial building. At the time of construction seven years ago, video gaming was not legal in Illinois. Uh, what I believe is most important is that the Planning Commission understand the decision made today will greatly impact the future look, fill, and future business activity that takes place or doesn't take place in the Bartlett Town Center as well as Bartlett as a whole tomorrow. Proper planning needs to be proactive, not reactive. And he signs it respectively, Scott J. Sutter. <laughs> that being said, is there anyone else from the audience? Any other comments from the board? And personally, I too would say that I have a, some sincere issues with, you know, I ran on the fact that I'm pro-business. I want to see business come into town. I want to see business succeed. But it concerns me when business such as this comes into a residential area in close proximity to children and uh, uh, the type of values that we're instilling into our, our community. So I would suggest that we go ahead and move this to the plan commission, but I do it with a certain degree of regret. That being said, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. That would be Maxine's special use, beer and wine. Jim, take it again. This is the uh, second video gaming <laughs> establishment proposal you have in front of you. Uh, Gary left with Laredo Hospitality. Um, this one is for the Brewster Creek Shopping Center at uh, Stearns and 59. It's again a special use permit to serve beer and wine in that location. This is actually the area where the former Blockbuster site uh, was. A part of that site is all occupied by Sherwin Williams, and this will fill that existing space, the remaining existing space. Again, their petition. Um, in the Brewster Creek Center, their floor plans a little different. They are uh, staff, They are having 30 dining area seats with fine gaming stations with t uh, seats at the gaming stations. Um, this is a uh, again a Class B liquor license for beer and wine only. And then once they get their license, if they do, they would apply for the state. Uh, Maxine's is got some renderings and I won't go into all these because they too have a uh, PowerPoint presentation but they are also affiliated with Stella's and they will go into that. Mr. Left is here. There's 185 parking spaces and they would require 21 for this use. So. Good evening, uh, Mr. President and Board of Trustees. Uh, 
thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to present this evening. Uh, my name is Gary Leff. I'm CEO of Laredo Hospitality. With me is Charity Johns. She's our VP of Operations. Uh, before we uh, get into Maxine's, uh, just a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're restaurant hospitality folks. Uh, we've collectively been in the business, uh, Charity and I, for uh, over 50 years, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and we have a team uh, that has another, you know, 30 years uh, or so of experience in the restaurant industry. Just a couple of highlights from our our, our careers. Uh, I started a concept uh, in the 90s called Stir Crazy. It was a full-service Pan-Asian restaurant. Um, the closest location to here would be Woodfield Mall in Schaumburg. Uh, grew that to uh, 10 units, sold that back in 2006. Have been involved in numerous projects since. Most recently led the consumer experience, so the design development of uh, the front of house experience and all the branding uh, for River. So I developed all seven bars and restaurants there. Uh, and the overall branding. Um, Charity, uh, prior to joining Laredo, was a VP of operations for Cozy Sandwich, uh, or Cozy uh, Cafe. Cozy's a uh, cafe sandwich shop with over 140 locations uh, nationwide. Prior to that, she was with Jamba Juice uh, as a VP of operations and uh, started early on her, uh, in her career at Starbucks. I'm going to let Charity uh, take you through... Uh, some of the presentation now. Good evening. Um, wow, what a meeting. Um, so I'm going to try to kind of go through and hopefully highlight for you what is different about our family of brands and a little bit about our organization that we think differentiates us and would be a good fit um, for Brewster Creek in, in Bartlett. Um, as you're probably already aware, Stella's Place is my mid-century modern gal. She is um, sort of in the 60s era, and um, she is a cafe, and I refer to her as she, because each one of these brands has their own personality. And as you enter the space, you sort of get um, the feel of a um, living room, family room combination working um, with, an odd, with a nod to sort of mid-century modern finishes um, for today's person. Shelby's, um, well, she is a little bit of vintage Americana. She happens to be my favorite out of the family of brands. Gary tends to like Stella. Um, and then we have um, the rest of the team kind of voting and cheering on Maxine's. Um, Shelby's is a little bit more of a vintage farmhouse look and feel. Um, you'll see that it has finishes much like your current pottery barn does. Um, and so it takes on a completely different look and feel in sort of the sense that it's uh, a little homier and I find it to be um, sort of how my house is stylized. Perhaps that's why I like it so much. Maxine's um, is from an era that I, I really sort of resonate with my dad and my mom. Um, it's sort of that 50s Rat Pack era, the music I grew up listening to. Um, and has that sort of black and white look and feel on the wall um, finishes, but is a little bit moodier um, and slightly more hip, if you will. Um, we're here to talk about Maxine's because um, in Brewster Creek we thought this was a really good complement to the Stellas that we're already bringing to town. Um, because it has sort of that more um, rich, sort of warm feeling inside, um, there's a level of camaraderie that you can feel in the space. And these are actual renderings. Um, I am going to show you some real pictures of our fully built out Stellas and Hoffman Estates here. But what you'll really under, um, take a look at sort of in our design and development is the way the space works together. The cafe and dining area is really up front with the counter sort of in the center there. And then you'll see um, in the rendering, the picture up top he has a bookcase separation which um, right now is not appointed with the artifacts of the era, but will be. Um, one of my favorite passions is shopping for vintage wares that fit into that schematic. Um, and then beyond that, where you see the gaming area. I highlight the gaming area because I associate that with what we've done in all of the restaurants and brands we've been a part of, is really appointing it to have finishes that people would appreciate, much like your bowling alleys are doing right now. 
I grew up in the bowling business, and we certainly didn't have those fancy shoes and lanes and people serving us at the lanes. Um, I think if my dad would have thought of that, maybe we would have stayed in business a little longer. <laughs> but we also, um, I would associate that with what movie theaters are doing now. Your, your chair reclines, you can put your soda. Actually, I think my mom told me she got a glass of wine the other day at the movie theater. Um, so this gaming area is really sort of designed for um, true entertainment value. It has a plush chair. It has a complete station where you can plug in your cell phone. It has a swing arm table. There are movable ottomans so you can game with friends. Um, so if you are a gamer, it really is a place that you can go and really enjoy yourself. Um, if you're not a gamer, up front in the cafe area, we have a really fantastic menu, one that um, Gary and I worked really hard on designing so that we could bring um, food and beverage into the establishment that was easy to execute, um, easy to eat with friends, shareable plates, um, but also um, something that people would enjoy. And, and, you know, we did some fun things. We have deviled eggs on the menu and maybe some other things that are from the era that people sort of enjoyed as they were growing up. I like deviled eggs, so um, I think they're delicious. So then um, I'll take you on to the next. That is our menu. Um, it has a lot of Light Bites minis. Um, minis to me right now are sort of what's hip in um, food and beverage. They're the small um, sliders, if you will. Um, there are light bites, we have flatbread pizzas, but everything is somewhat shareable. So you'll see a spinach and artichoke dip, you'll see Bavarian pretzels with um, cheese dip, you'll see chicken wings, but at the same time you'll also see um, beef sliders, chicken sliders, um, and things that um, people can sort of share um, amongst each other. The other thing that I think is a little bit unique is, um, and a little nod to the past, is we've incorporated some, some classics, if you will, but they're with a new spin. So they're also in sliders, but we'll put things like um, uh, an egg salad or a tuna salad for lunch on sliders because we know people kind of enjoy that as a lunch fare. Breakfast is um, a full breakfast menu, freshly um, fresh omelet sandwiches on bagels with roasted um, peppers, some with sausage, some with plain and cheese, um, hot cinnamon roll, things of that nature are also on the menu. We have a full espresso beverage menu, cappuccino, lattes, espresso, as well as beer and wine, and then of course your soft drink offering. Um, I think one of the trustees had asked about the age demographic. I kind of think about this as a place my mom and I could go. Um, I know you can't tell, but I'm in my mid-40s. Um, so that usually gets a chuckle. What's wrong with you guys tonight? Um, <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> so that's fine. But I, <laughs> but I usually think of this a place that my mom and I could go. I have a 10-year-old. Um, she's not welcome. I take her lots of places, um, and I adore her. But this is a night out with my sister or with my mom or with friends that I can sort of enjoy myself. I'm not a loud bar person. Um, I loved them when in my 20s, liked them in my 30s, can't stand them in my 40s. So um, it's a place that I can go now. And I love that about this. Um, it's, it's highly stylized. It has great personalized service. Um, you know, Gary and I talk about our corporate culture, and it's really about cultivating relationships through personalized service. And it's, so we get to know you in the space, and um, it feels like your, your place to go. And that's really important to us as we build the brands. Um, this is an actual Stella's. So this is what Stella's looks like inside. So you see the swooping countertop and sun above the very geometric shapes. It's very mid-century. This is our Hoffman Estates location. Um, so you'll see it has a completely different look and feel than Maxine's deliberately, but the space works the exact same um, so that there is um, 21 and older. And then you'll see there shall be... For, sake, um, for the sake of expediency, could we yeah. maybe keep, stick to the, uh, to the uh, yep. place that you're suggesting? That's Maxine's, Max, Maxine's, which we went through. And then, um, and then I'll let Gary wrap it up with the design team. Yeah, we don't need to spend much time on the design team. Um, it just we put together uh, what we consider a world-class design team. More important, when we are just showing renderings, uh, same team that uh, I worked with on developing all the food and beverage uh, 
units out at Rivers Casino. So this is a well-done establishment. Uh, we're investing a significant amount of money. It's not just about the gaming. We think the cafe experience is very important. Uh, again, it's a, an experience for those people that want an adult experience and not just going to a bar. We're going to have other entertainment. We'll have a half a dozen iPads available for people that they can use to play free games, read the newspaper, uh, and we'll have other apps. We think we may expand that if that becomes popular. Uh, so again, it's the gaming is important, but we think this is uh, you know a holistic experience more more than just the gaming. And last but not least, just to wrap it up, we're local. Uh, Charity and I both live. I live in the city. She lives in the northern suburb. Our office is in Des Plaines. Uh, we have a lot. We're highly experienced, but we have a real passion for delivering what we think are, you know, the best experiences out there. Uh, we think this provides a unique and attractive experience. And last but not least, we have done the math uh, on tax revenues, and we believe that this will generate on the gaming side uh, somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars annually for the village of Bartlett. Uh, and on the food and beverage side, uh, you know, we're anticipating somewhere between, you know, three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in food and beverage revenue. So that's it. Any, any questions from the board? Not at this time. <laughs> I know we all want to go to bed. <laughs> Trustee Cameron, can I ask a question? Yes. I'd like to ask a question, and this really goes, I think, to the sustainability of these kinds of facilities. Uh, because we've seen a couple of different ones and they're all a little different. And, and I think what is, is going to be the issue here is frankly the food. Mm -hmm. Because if you, you want to gamble, but you don't have anything decent, decent to eat, you're going to go gamble somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you can get that liquor somewhere else. So we've seen some proposals, uh, and a couple that the board has, uh, approved that have real food. They have salads, they have paninis. We're all very, uh, sort of suspicious of the first proposal here because it was all microwave. And if it's all microwave, uh, frankly, I don't personally think that it's got a lot of survivability. Now, I looked at your menu, and you talked all about, you know, fresh this and fresh that, but I didn't see any kitchen in your plans. And so uh, are you a real restaurant? Are you going to make things fresh? Are you going to bring them in and be a step different from a microwave? I think that's important for the board to think about because I really believe that goes to the heart of sustainability of these establishments. People right. will uh, walk based on their stomachs. Yeah, we 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 would agree with that. Um, and we've I've been involved in a variety of uh, different types of food and beverage outlets. Uh, you know, I just want to know what this is. Is there going to be any cooking going on, or is it microwavable? That's there bad. is. You know, we're making fresh egg sandwiches. Uh, you know, the deviled eggs. We we have a blend. We've worked with outside vendors to curate what we think are some of the best products. Uh, a lot of our prep is done off site. Uh, just like Cozy, and I don't know how many of you have been to a Cozy, uh, and Ch Co Charity can talk about their food prep. It's not done, most of that's not done on site. They're not cooking chicken on site. They're not cooking proteins on site. They work with vendors. So a lot of that type of prep is done off site, uh, which will be the case here. But we will be doing a lot of, we'll be doing some prep on site and a lot of assembly, and we think our food is good. Uh, we're very proud of the food we're serving. And then just one follow-up question that, that uh, Trustee Aarons had asked uh, the other business that I thought was, was problematic, and that is how many employees will you have on site at the same time? Uh, we'll have, again, depending on the hours, anywhere from one to three employees, and a total of, of eight to ten employees total for the establishment. And, and then I'll... Then, uh, I think the problem with that, and the mayor made reference to this, is the state law does require that you have the ability to watch uh, the gaming all the time. And if you've got one person there and they are pouring beer and they are making egg sandwiches and they are watching the thing, that's not going to work. Yeah. We've consulted with the gaming board on this and we've poured them through our facilities. Uh, one, we're 21 and over. Um, uh, and so that it does not relinquish the obligation to watch it. It does not, but the way we've designed our facilities, we think we have oversight of both the cafe and the gaming area, whether it's one, two, or three employees in the establishment. And again, we've consulted with the 
gaming board on it, and we feel very comfortable that we have good coverage and visibility on that. Even if we have won, it's early morning, uh, or you know, perhaps late at night when it's not as busy. Yes, we we do believe that. I just I just want to clarify. So your proposal is to open a gaming establishment next to the Walgreens at Stern 59. Yes, in the former okay. Blockbuster space. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a restaurant slash gaming establishment. Was that a trick yeah. question? <laughs> More my, traffic studies done. Yeah, I'd like to do more traffic studies. With my that. question yeah. might go to the to the staff here again. It, uh, of the facilities coming in, don't we already? Uh, do you have another facility that that they're proposing? Is, You're absolutely a, correct. We have Stella's, Stella's that the board has approved, and is this, it's is waiting, this, as I understand, it's still is this, waiting for its license. Right? Is this by the same company? Yes. 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 Did you not? Catch the oh, I, knew, I did. I'm thinking sheep and fiddle. So we have. So you have that much confidence in Bartlett that you're preparing. You're proposing to bring in two of these facilities into our, into our city. We we do. We think the demographics, the regional draw. Uh, you know, we've looked elsewhere around. You know, a little bit up further in Streamwood, and we've looked elsewhere, and we thought this was the best opportunity. The way we manage our business and put in infrastructure with regional oversight. Um, and you know, given the small nature of our facility, we uh, we're confident that uh, this area supports those two facilities. Again, and it being small, if people do want a game and only five machines, they may you know one they can go over to the other establishment, or two they may prefer one of our brands over the other brand. So, uh, yes, we're we wouldn't be making the sizable investment uh, that we're going to make if we didn't believe that it was. Um, feasible or a good, you know, good investment decision. And I'll try my same question. Do you consider yourself a gaming establishment or a restaurant? We consider ourselves an adult cafe uh, with gaming. Okay. <laughs> like I mean, we, we, Brian would we really are. I, I, I will tell you, we're investing. <laughs> and I would invite any of you, if you'd like, to come over to Hoffman Estates, which is fully built out, fully appointed. Uh, it's not going to feel like a gaming establishment to you. It's going to feel like an upscale cafe. Where, uh, where is that? That's in Hoffman Village uh, at Golf and Barrington, uh, where the Mariano's is. Okay. Uh, not open yet. We plan to be open in the next six weeks, but we'd be happy to you know, host any of you if you want to get in touch with us uh, or with me um, or Charity. And uh, you know, I know it's not far from here, and I think you – when you walk in, you would not say, wow, this is a gaming establishment. I'm pretty confident. And we've toured several communities through that establishment, and I think the reactions have been pretty consistent. So, uh, again, everything we do is first class, uh, premium, and we think we're delivering that here as well. Is there any other questions for Mr. Leff? Gary, where do you live? I live in Chicago, in the city. TL wanted to know if you were going to join the chamber. Of course. We jo always join the chamber. Do you, do you There's no questions. Along the chamber and um, where your other place is? We're just, uh, we've joined some chambers, uh, but again, we're new. We're only a, over, a little over a year old, and given uh, the state of uh, Illinois and how they're issuing gaming licenses, we do not have any locations built yet, or, or open yet, I should say. I apologize, I thought you had. No. So Hoffman's not open to the public? It's not open to the public yet. Six weeks. Yes, in the next six weeks. Well, if the board doesn't have any further questions, we'd open it up to the audience then. Thank you, Mr. Leff. Mm -hmm. Hi, DJ Mills again. Um, I'm concerned about all this video gaming coming in, especially since it's so close in the in the area I mean we're talking town center we're talking across a street from Bannermans what what doesn't stop Bannermans to have even more gaming especially if we're going to do it per square footage he has a beautiful place he's doing well it's big so there's a limit to you, you yeah. know, okay, limit yes, five. Five. okay so now we have if we if he has a uh, gaming over there now we have a gaming across the street now we're going to have one over at um, or sheep and fiddles or, or whatever. I'm like, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to just make this like a, a little bit of a casino here and casino there type of thing? I mean, what are we doing for the kids in the area? What, what kind of businesses are we trying to bring in to help 
the teenagers stay off the streets and, and drugs and stuff. Well, I mean, with, I, with all due respect, I, I have to tell you that it's not um, uh, the village works very hard at attracting a, a, a million different kinds of business. No, I, I understand and, that. And I, well, I kind of take exception to that because I get asked that all the time. Mm -hmm. Are you just looking for gaming places? Well, no. Okay. Um, we would gladly, gladly welcome any mm -hmm. kind of business into town. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that the the, the, the gaming industry yeah. is it's, hot right now. Right, exactly. And so that's, that's what we're getting mm -hmm. requests for. Right. Just as uh, 15 years ago, we had at least 15 different pizza places. <laughs> and 20 years ago, we had mm -hmm. at least that many um, uh, video rental stores. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, yeah. it's the whole concept sounds great. We do great. try to attract others. Yeah, I mean, the concept sounds great, a restaurant and gaming, but what I hear out of it, it's more gaming than restaurant because well, well, this, a, this is all prepackaged food. Said. Just tonight, we just approved Tokyo mm -hmm. Japan's license for liquor license going to the Nest Cafe mm -hmm. right across the street. So, I mean, there's mm -hmm. – we, we, and at the beginning of the night, we spent a long, long time trying to decipher what the game plan was to make sure that we were responsibly offering these mm -hmm. right. establishments to gamble. So once the state says you can okay. do it if you have a license, then it's, uh, then yeah. it's uh, onerous on us so to So my to concern out. is they're all kind of like clustered in one yeah. small area and that's the objective of Bartlett. Of, of and the, then the, the other loopholes. thing is we're the only – the town center is the only out of the other locations that has residents. And, and we do understand your concern, TJ. Okay. Yes. I appreciate it. Thanks, TJ. Thank you. I won't delay this much longer. I just, uh, you know, one concern that I, that I think you might want to put on the, the table is it seems that a lot of people that do gaming, and I don't personally like to bounce between machines, and uh, I certainly would have a concern, and maybe you want to track this as it goes on, is how many uh, perhaps drunk driving arrests and things we have of people bouncing between these various establishments all within town uh, because this machine wasn't hot, so I'm going to go over to the other place, now I'm going to go to the other place, now I'm going to go to the other place. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. One last comment. Okay, so we've got McDonald's, we've got um, the kinder care, and then you want to put an adult gaming establishment in, and then the taekwondo store. So though I could walk my daughter past all that to go to Taekwondo, and on the weekends I go past Blackjacks to get over to Kohler Field. I mean, another gaming? I think you guys should say no. Well, if there's no other questions from the audience and there's no other questions by the board, then once again, I would move that we go ahead and plan the uh, move this to the uh, Planning Commission, and I do it with some degree of regret. Um, but that's that's it. Hit on the planning and zoning. That's all you got for me, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next item on the agenda, uh, under License and Ordinance, is Trustee Cara Benero. Vince, wake up. I'm waking up. To give you three minutes. <laughs> That was a good report, wasn't it? Last <laughs> item on the agenda. Uh, let me point out that Trustee Shipman no noted that that's the last item final. on the agenda. Okay. Is there something that you want to comment on or you want me to read this? Whatever you like. Okay. You just make a motion to move it to. Okay. This is for out of town caterers liquor license. If they're receiving the attached Vince, letter. You need to up to your microphone. Up to your microphone so we can. This is for an out-of-town caterer's liquor license. After receiving the attached letter from Bruce Suffren, the owner of Banbury Fair, the mayor asked if the Bartlett Liquor Control Ordinance could be amended to reinstate a, a liquor license for out-of-town caterers, given that few, if any, local caterers hold that old Class K liquor license that are willing to cater weddings at Banbury Fair. Draft ordinance amending the Liquor Control Ordinance, adding an out-of-town caterer Liquor license classification is attached for the board's consideration. You don't need to yeah, read the whole thing. Um, just briefly, uh, you see the letter from Bruce Suffren. Um, we tried to do this with a Class K and utilize mm -hmm. our in-town businesses that had a K 
caterer's license. They already had to have an on-premises liquor license, and then they would qualify for a caterer's license if they chose to. Um, as you can tell from his letter, we've, they've tried. There's a couple of businesses that have gotten them, and then because of either the cost, but more uh, really the main issue is some of the loop uh, steps you have to go through with the state or internally in those businesses with staffing them, <coughs> they've declined to renew those licenses. So what he's found is he's having uh, trouble uh, getting an in-town caterer to get a Class K and then uh, provide service there. Now, it, it's not just Banbury Fair. This is an issue that can affect also the new banquet facility down at, uh, I forget the name, but Nicodemus uh, connected with that. Um, I had, when this issue came up, uh, the past village president and um, had concern with having control. So at a wedding, if let's say there were underage serve, serving of alcohol, um, what can you do about it? Well, one of the things that you can do is levy a fine, suspend their license, or revoke it. It's difficult to do that if they're out of town. So that the premise was uh, that we would have more control if they were limited to in-town caterers. And so that's how it was addressed. It's not working in that regard from a practical standpoint. Um, and so the board did have a class M but it was to bail out uh, would-be brides. They had already signed contracts, and so they did have a Class M for a time period. There were no issues with that. But uh, the board was clear when they did it. They sunsetted it, so it went away, and they wanted to go with this, you know, limiting it to the in-town caterers. So what you have before you is resurrecting what we call Class M. It's a little more involved than it was before. Um, and it requires uh, that they be have a retail liquor license from the town in which they're located. They have a caterer's license from the town, out of town, in which they're located. Uh, they have a state caterer's license, and they have a Bartlett caterer's license. And then lastly, when you're out of town, the state requires that you have a special use permit for specific dates and times. And so procedurally, if they're out of town, they'll come in, get an M. They have to have the criminal background check and the fingerprinting and all that. Um, the mayor would, once the board, and you'll decide how many class M's to create. But once they have it, uh, it's issued, they have to come back with specific dates and times to show their state liquor license their state, their special use permit from the state. So there's a, uh, an extra built-in protection there. So I guess the only, I mean, I'll open it up, or okay, whoever Vince can open up for discussion uh, or questions, but the one thing left open in this memo is, do you want to create a certain number of those M's up front uh, or as they come in each time? You know, I'm applying for an M because unfortunately what we found with some of the wedding planners is it's always last minute. They had you know, planned that through and then we're scrambling to uh, accommodate a bride who's uh, and having a daughter getting married. Uh, there's hell to pay. Those licenses would still have to come before the mayor. Yes. Regardless of yes. what set a, a, they still a, have to have the criminal a limited record. number or an unlimited number, they still need to come before the right. board or more, more practically the mayor yes. in either way. Correct. Yes. They still have to go through the background check. It's just would they have to now also, you know, wait for a board agenda to get on to create it and then, you know, then the background check, um, you know, and then uh, come forward. So this way if they were existing – they go through our normal process. The mayor writes a letter to the state saying, I will issue, uh, they'll have a caterer's license, but they won't have the special use. That has to come back again 
for the specific dates and time, times of the events. And just so I, I'm clear, too, I don't believe this restricts the existing liquor license holders who have, in the past, turned down Banbury Fair. That doesn't restrict them from providing no. the service, but no, not at all. No. But, but what, what Banbury has found, and I think Nico will find the same thing as he's operating his facility, it's an additional um, headache for some of these restaurants in the town. I shouldn't say headache, but it's an additional cost and, and uh, administrative uh, burden for some of the existing uh, places to go above and beyond just catering their own thing. And they don't and have the staff. Yeah, These are generally the Saturdays, do. Saturday nights, and those businesses are doing their own right. thing. It's really been a staffing issue, I think, that's been uh, what Bruce has found is difficult. Yeah, and I, th yeah, I think Nico has kind of opened the door to have a, a catering facility or a, a banquet facility mm -hmm. here, and we're going to have to have something like this. And then I think Bruce also would increase his business there as well. His letter pointed out an, an investment in advertising, and it, you know. Uh, the other thing that this does is it reduces the fee. We had a $500 fee for out of town, and we had an annual fee for the Class K for in town. This proposes to make it $200. We can't charge a different fee for out of town, but we do have an additional cost because there's additional work to do the criminal background check that an in town guy would already have. Uh, business would already have because they've got their underlying liquor license. And we'll also have to administer that second go-round of the state of the special use permit. So there's an additional $50 fee to the out-of-town. Um, and I guess I'd just point out that the state law does not require the in-town caterers to get that special use permit, you know, where they have to go back and give specific dates. So if they're an in-town caterer under state law, that's what they need. They don't have to then get the special use permit for each separate event. And it has the same provisions, you know, Bassett trained and all those things. And they'll have a site plan to show where it is. You know. Do you know how much the special use from the state is? The cost to uh, I town? want to say $250, but I'm not certain. So they're looking at $500 before they step into Bartlett to at least 500 But they can do that on an annual basis. So okay. if they... Do several, more than once, it pays, it pays off for okay. itself if they get a couple of events. Yeah. Whereas before, they paid $500 and they got one shot. And it might be one event. Right. Okay. So really, what we're doing is we're reducing the cost. And we still, yeah. we limited Banbury to six, or was it four? That still is in their special use ordinance. So they still have a limit on the number they can have in a year. That was four, it's right? Six. Or is it six? Six, I think. Six. Yeah, I, think it, I think it's six. Six, so, yeah. I um I don't think the is I don't know. is the fifty dollar fee enough? Yeah, I, t I uh, tried to increase that. Yeah, he tried to. We were going to have quite a bit difference, but we really can't. Uh, it's going to be a pass through cost. Yeah. Okay. So so we were going to yeah, have quite a bit higher or a big difference, and looked at that and can't do. When it. the letter came in, just so you know, full, full disclosure, I talked with spoke with Brian a little bit about how you can resurrect this M. And my initial, uh, just to save us some time and questions, you guys might have the same ones. My initial objective was to make it more difficult for outside Bartlett caterers, or not more difficult, but at least uh, provide an advantage to stay in town um, for these caterers. Um, and you can't, I, I, we found that you cannot do that. You have to be equal inside and outside. But they do, like, like Ryan had mentioned, you avoid the extra step of a state's special use, I think, permit if you're in town. Did I? Yeah, okay, right. that's correct. So somebody in town pays roughly 250 somebody out of town pays 500 No, this is 200 in town, 200. essentially 250 out of town. So pretty much Plus the, the same. state special use Plus permit. Plus the state. Well, yeah. They have some out of town. They have some state charges. I don't know. Which our local businesses would not be required to do. I, I that's right. So, still a local business, caterers. a local business to do this would spend about two hundred bucks. An out-of-town business to do this would spend about five hundred bucks. They they will also need a state caterer's license, as well as a Bartlett caterer's license. I don't recall that fee. But what they wouldn't need is the, for out-of-town. It almost sounds like we're making it more complicated. They need two. Well, <laughs> I, 
the differences are state law, not us. Right. We're not adding any layers of extra licenses on our end. What, what we did was we called them out in here because what we found was some of our local got the local, but they didn't know they had to get the state, and then the state said, no, you know, you need to have our state license. You should have known. We put it in here just to almost alert them, uh, but we didn't add a layer that I can't control what the state requirements are. And I guess, really, if I may, the only question kind of I have to follow up to this is, um, as I recall the original conversations on this a year or so back, the concern was, and then I guess I would ask how do we address this, somebody comes, a licensee comes in, they have an event that girl's gone wild and it goes bad. <laughs> Other than the chief's crew writing a local ordinance citation, what do we have? Um, in the way of enforcement. The person who did it. Th that, that's Levy a fine. That I had, but I didn't use girls gone wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Levy the fine. Uh, again, remember, they'll have a, an annual, as all our licenses are one year, they'll have an annual caters license, so you can still suspend or revoke that, and you can take that into account whether or not to renew it again. Uh, it isn't as much control because the difference before was we could suspend or revoke their underlying license. So that's right. the distinction. But it, they won't be able to cater, and, and that's it. So that's the difference in control, and that was the issue before that, that was a big uh, deal, and uh, the, the distinction that was made why we, we had the basis to favor in town. So we don't have that with this, but you, you can take away the caterer's license. They can also have some trouble with the state. And so, so that is, you know, the difference. But, you know, it's sort of the trade-off with some control loss, with accommodating businesses to make it viable. I mean, we did try to, to make that available. It hasn't panned out at work. Can I ask a question? Just wouldn't be the same without you, Jim. I know. I, I had to. <laughs> Remember a few months ago when Nico was up here and he wanted to open a full-time facility, and we put him under a lot of scrutiny. Last year, Bruce came in and he said he wanted to try a couple weddings. One of them was his daughter, and he wanted to try a couple others. Just, you know, expand his business. Everybody likes Bruce. This is not personal on Bruce. But think about where Banbury Fair is. That's extremely residential. Your strip mall is on 59, you've got housing behind them. But right here, I think that's another concern. You've got a business on the end of a block, a few businesses, Lucky Jacks, whatever. But you got all that residential. Has there been any dialogue with the residents about him expanding into being more a, of a banquet facility in addition to the special uh, licenses because last year was to he had commitments to the brides he had to get it done if he's going to expand into that business I think just like we did with Nico we have to make sure that people on Hickory and the other streets they don't have an issue with this he's limited in the special use ordinance that was granted to six events a year because of those reasons. and when those were granted he was also people around there were also given the opportunity to probably voice their opinion on those so that was already passed and, and we, d we did give him some opposition just because of that. And the parking issue and, and you know, everything else that He's went along with it. I don't know if you were at the, all those at those meetings, but, yeah, we gave that an awful lot of scrutiny. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Yeah. Moving on to the next board meeting. Moving on to the next meeting. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. One question. Do you want me to put a certain number, like five M's in there to start with? Or I think that would no? make the most sense. Five. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll have more of these really long. Well, but yeah. Five per location or five for the entire village? Entire village. I think five entire. And then Nicodinos if we individual the individual on. Nicodinos could potentially be looking He's for a, one every other week. No, they'll only need one. I move to adjourn. Okay, because yeah, I understand your motion to adjourn. Second.
Moved by Trustee Aaron, seconded by Trustee Shipman. Welcome Clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Aaron's? We'll do it for Aaron's. Hey, we're not done yet. Yes. 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 Cameron? Yes. Carbonero? Yes. Martin? Yes. Frankie? Yes. Shipman? Yeah, that gets on my oh, We're not done yet. Eric, Eric. Yeah, I hear it. Right. Finger gets off right now. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 it doesn't work. Oh, I don't take it.